That's good. Okay. Hi, everyone. We are live. We have our regular weekly live stream with the amazing Jeffrey Tucker and Jean Epstein, two of my favorite people and definitely favorite Austrian economists. We are this week talking about intellectual property rights. We are asking the question, should intellectual property have a role in Bitcoin? And we're comparing open source to closed source. We're talking about patents and copyrights and all of those wonderful things. I think that it's a super interesting topic, especially in the Bitcoin space. Bitcoin, as you know, started out as open source software. It's put out for anyone to take and use and iterate on however they want. And recently we've seen a swarm of banks and companies coming into the industry and putting a lot of patents on this technology taking this uh, this tech and saying, oh, well, we're going to apply it specifically to insurance and we're going to put seven patents on that. So it's a very interesting topic for sure. And uh, it's just wonderful having Jade and, and Jeffrey here discussing that. They're both a wealth of knowledge on the topic of intellectual property. So thank you so much for joining me, guys. Pleasure. Thank you uh, for having us, uh, Naomi. Uh, okay. Jeff. Uh, just before we get started, Jean, so uh, if everyone in this in the chat today, if you have questions for them, yeah. I have a feeling, I have a uh, sneaking suspicion that Jeffrey and Jean are going to more or less be presenting one side of this case. Um, and yeah. so I would love for audience questions if you wanted to play devil's advocate or if the two of you wanted to play devil's advocate, yeah. I definitely encourage that, asking questions, you know, um, issues that people usually bring up with, with this topic, even if you might not necessarily be on that side. But if you are in the chat, uh, hi, everyone. And, and I'm just seeing Jan and, and Roger, Polly, DMG, Lambo Lama. Thank you, everyone who is in there. Uh, and if you have questions, please send them in because I know that there may be people here who do not agree with what is being said. Said. So make sure you bring your questions. I will be feeding those to Jeffrey and Dean in the chat. Uh, we have some dinging going on on someone's uh, uh, side of things. Uh, so you may want to just turn that off if you can. But uh, I'm going to leave you two to it, to your regular discussions and hop off the camera. And then I will hop back in uh, at the end to, to wrap things up. So thank you so much, guys. All right, guys. Uh, yeah, Jeff, uh, let me uh, help us proceed in an orderly fashion. Uh, uh, to uh, to uh, discuss this story. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, intellectual property consists of four different categories, trademarks uh, and, uh, and, uh, and brands. That's the first. Trade secrets, that's the second. Patents and copyrights. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, and um, uh, I want to uh, di discuss uh, trademarks and brands first, because hmm. in my view, let me make the case uh, about it. Uh, and uh, I think this may surprise certain people. Uh, Stefan Kinsella, uh, in his book uh, Against uh, Intellectual Property, I think has written very intelligently about this. Uh, he makes this point. Uh, suppose that there is a brand known as Jeffrey Tucker Toothpaste. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, so I buy it, and it turns out not to have the high quality that Jeff Tucker knows to put into the toothpaste he sells. It's crappy toothpaste, and in fact, it's not issued by J Jeff Tucker. It's issued by some piker named Gene Epstein, perhaps. Okay, so so who is being harmed? And all he says is that um, you had a contract. The agreement was you were buying Jeff Tucker toothpaste, and you, as the customer, have a right to bring a case. So that therefore, um, the the nuanced position about trademarks and uh, and brands is that is that customers should not be defrauded, and mm -hmm. that from an Austrian libertarian standpoint, there is such a thing as fraud. And if you're you if you say to somebody, here's the toothpaste, says Jeff Tucker toothpaste, enjoy, turns out not to be it then it's not really Jeff Tucker who owns the product of his brains. It's that the customer has a right to expect uh, the specifications of Jeff Tucker toothpaste and can bring a case, can bring a case with other consumers in some kind of class action suit. And then very possibly, by the way, Jeff Tucker himself might be footed by, might be paying the legal bills in order to bring this case, but it's not brought by him. It's, by, it's brought by the consumers who have been defrauded. What do you think of that, Jeff? Well, you're you're taking on the the hardest topic first. I mean, the, the, really, I think that's yeah. the easiest. I well, think it's the easiest topic because I think that it's really a case of fraud. I think well, it's the easiest. Is yeah. it? It's you know, Gene. Sometimes yeah. your your sense of you know binary, you know, uh, good and evil, easy, hard. Good God. Um, 
It's it's a little out my of Roth, hand. My Rothbardian mind is bothering you. My well, Misesian concepts of the world let are me, just having a little me, bit let unsettled. Me give, yeah. Let me give you a a a a, a, a more realistic uh, case. Uh, one in the case of travel bags, and the other in the case of ice cream. Okay, so yeah. uh, there's a travel bag called Swiss. I don't know if you you've ever heard of it, yeah, but it's right, yeah. kind of kind of a high end brand. So I I I went to the store and 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 I was in a, and it was a hurry and I I bought I bought uh, what I thought was a Swiss bag uh, because it had the uh, uh, a logo that was very similar, um, but the brand was actually called Euro Swiss something like that. I mean now this is clearly an attempt to sort of free ride off the coattails of this high end brand uh, and sell a, a much cheaper product. Um, um, now, was I defrauded? I, I would say in that case, uh, not. Was the Swiss company defrauded? I would say absolutely not. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. they have a very successful product, and and it's hardly a surprise that other people would uh, would 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 uh, go along with it. Um, actually, I'm going to mention a third case. The second case is the case of uh, uh, Moose Tracks ice cream. Okay, so Moose Tracks became a very popular brand. Now, as we know, you can't patent a recipe. So you know you can't trademark a recipe or copyright a recipe. So anybody can make moose tracks, <coughs> and anybody can reverse engineer anything. And so on the shelf, there started to appear these things called uh, cow tracks, and uh, and 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 elk tracks, uh, and it was clearly just the same thing and much cheaper. Well, the company sued successfully, wow. and got these brands removed from from. So I think that's wrong. Uh, but the thing is, it's ultimately unenforceable because then the impersonators quickly changed it to something like uh, cow prints, uh, you know, and uh, and and so therefore signaling to consumers, this is Moose Tracks ice cream, but it's much cheaper. Got away with it. The court said, okay, that's totally passable. My own view is, uh, I'm not sure you're entirely right about this because uh, I'm not sure that consumers are in fact being defrauded. Uh, by buying something that's of an identical name. Um, uh, when I was in Istanbul a few years ago, I would go along these high-end streets, there would be the real Nike shop where all the shoes were two and $300. And then right next door, there's the fake Nike shop where all the, all the shoes were 20 and $30, okay? So cut off a zero. And, and everybody who goes into the fake Nike shop knows that they're buying fakes, right? So they, the shoes look the same, they're branded as Nike, but everybody knows exactly what's going on. So to me, it's a matter of what the consumer is uh, worried about buying. Um, I, I once had a friend who had a, what's a high-end purse brand? I don't know anything about purses, but let's say mm -hmm. it's a, what is it? Name one. Name I one. don't know, Jeff. I'm not okay. I would say it's a coach, a coach bag. It's a coach bag, yeah. and and I said nice, nice, uh, nice coach bag. And she said, oh, thanks very much. It was very expensive. And I said, well, yeah, probably about four hundred dollars, right? She goes, yeah, about like that. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Why wouldn't you just buy a fake coach bag, which you can buy on the street for uh, ten bucks? And she said, well, that's very risky. Like I would get away with it for people that are standing five feet away, ten feet away, maybe even uh, right up close. But uh, maybe, for example, the bag would start to wear in a certain way that actual experts on coach bags would recognize as being uh, uh, fake. And then once I was outed among my friend's set, my social set, that was carrying around a fake coach bag, then that would be a, a source of humiliation for me. So I'd rather uh, pay 10 times the price to avoid the, that risk of humiliation. Uh, or I All should right, say, well, she Jeff, would rather have her okay. her mother uh, pay that. But um, okay, Jeff, you're but, giving me many my, examples. My point, but yeah. my point is that quite often consumers want to buy the fake product, and and they're not being defrauded, even though uh, they know the thing is labeled Coke. It's not really Coke. They know it's labeled Nike. It's not really Nike. They know this. So I don't know how you. Uh, as a jurist, can distinguish between people who want to just pay less for their product, and and those who have been legitimately uh, defrauded. Okay, well, let me respond, to Jeff, and say only that that give me some echo here. Um, the, uh, you're you're talking about, I guess, a case in which instead of selling Jeff Tucker toothpaste, I call it Joe Tucker toothpaste, and I'm trying to subtly 
get mislead a few people into thinking that it's actually issued by you. Uh, I only want to say broaden the issue and say, I don't think there's a, a single rule or law that you would want in your anarcho-capitalist society that, that would not have difficulties in, in application. All, all I'm saying is that if there's yeah. a clear, if, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I put out the Jeff Tucker toothpaste and, and it's got that, that same picture of Jeff in his bow tie. It's got the same coloration. It's, if, if it's an attempt to, 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 to imply that this really is the Jeff Tucker toothpaste, and it turns out that it's clearly not, I think that's <coughs> an open and shut case. But as you indicate, uh, for the most part, uh, these things are not really a matter of fraud. Well, obviously, if it's if it's if it's much cheaper, but clearly, right. I, I want to bring it home to. But, but wait, to, well, let's, let's, Jeff, let's, Jeff, you spoke for five minutes. Give me an extra <laughs> minute, for God's sake. Let, let me just let me just say that. Let's bring it home to Bitcoin. The fact is, the matter is that that Bitcoin is forked. You can copy the software, mm. and, and indeed, that's all wonderful. You can do it, but the point is that if, mm. I, if somebody says this is Bitcoin. Bitcoin, B-I-T-C, Bitcoin, and then it's really not, it's an altcoin, then I think that's a case of fraud. And that, now, that, and that, and that now, now, you, now a jury might say he, he actually did know, when I'm on the stand, I say I got, I got defrauded, he, they, he said it was Bitcoin and it wasn't, well, well, don't you know what Bitcoin sells for? There might be various ways of proving that I'm bringing a bogus case of fraud. But the point is certainly, certainly you do acknowledge that fraud a fraud is indeed a violation of the non-aggression principle, and that in the pure example that I cited, where where the where where the where the the coloration of the two, the coloration of the box, the picture of Jeff Tucker is identical, then I'm being defrauded. Hey, wait, and, uh, that's all. yeah, but but you're, you're you're too quick to take a recourse to co to coercion. It's like you have this this lust to use the state to crack down on people. I I, I don't Too actually agree with that. Uh, yeah. I, I, look, I, the mar the law. I mean, markets are, are actually capable of sorting these things out. I'll give you another example. I'm just replete with endless numbers of fascinating, riveting examples that are that are enrapturing okay. our listeners right now. Um, another case is, say, Polo Cologne, all right? So I go to Amazon, I think, well, here's a, a, a Polo Cologne for, for $30, whereas at, at the store I would pay, I have to have to pay $100, I order it, and I use it for a few weeks, and I notice that the smell's not quite what I expected. It doesn't last as long as it's supposed to. Uh, you know, there's just things about it that are kind of triggering me to, and I suddenly realize, oh my God, I bought a fake. I bought a freaking fake, right? And so then I'm, so then what happens to me the next time? I'm wary. I'm wary. And so suddenly I realize, wow, I better more carefully read the user ratings. Uh, maybe I shouldn't even be using Amazon to buy my cologne. I should actually go to a reputable store. I correct my behavior. I, oftentimes, it's just, in other words, it's just not worth it to uh, to run around screaming in violation of uh, the NAP and calling the state because, like, what what's that's a very costly enterprise. Sometimes the best response to what you call fraud is just learning. Now, to bring it back to Bitcoin, I mean, I don't know if you intentionally decided to you know like open reopen this wound uh, again a year after the fork but but some people claim that bitcoin cash is uh uh, uh fr fraudulent because it's really an altcoin it's not really bitcoin i don't agree with that at all i happen to think that people are smart enough to figure out there's a difference between bitcoin core and bitcoin cash and i don't think that these 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 over the top histrionic claims of uh, br brand misrepresentation have any weight to them whatsoever. All right, let me respond. First of all, again, Jeff, let me remind you that in an anarcho-capitalist society, if you bother to read, say, The Ethics of Liberty by Murray Rothbard, you recognize that that it's not a society without law. It's a society without the state. It simply says that in a marketplace, uh, the, the law and adjudication of the law is better determined through the marketplace. Second, so this idea that I want to bring in the state is ridiculous. I'm talking about a proper law and the laws under the kind of society that you want. So please don't sound too utopian. There has to be law against murder, for example. Second, second, you are absolutely right, by the way, that the market does sort this out. And in that case, 
I admit, certainly agree, that my toothpaste example was ill-chosen because if, if if somebody spends a trivial amount of money on, on, on bogus Jeff Tucker toothpaste, probably that person is not going to try to bring a lawsuit. On the other hand, maybe if it happens over and over again and Jeff Tucker gets inflamed and he emails a lot of people who've been suckered, maybe a lawsuit will be brought. It would uh, probably, uh, no, uh, no, but let me finish. If, if you sell a car, if you sell a big ticket item, $20,000, sell a house, and, 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 and there's fraudulent claims being made, then you do have a case of fraud uh, to be brought. And, and so indeed, the, the market does sort these things out. And, and absolutely, uh, I, I, any, any nuisance lawsuits should be dismissed in a free market because the, loss, the, the market would be sorting these things yeah, out. Yeah, but, I, but I, you are being very unclear, uh, Gene. You're, you're, not, you're not actually being entirely transparent with, with your opinions or yeah. you haven't actually thought about yeah. the real world case. I mean, what do you do? And I, I can tell you what I do. Yeah. Uh, when I'm walking along the streets of New York and there's there's a guy selling a bunch of uh, sunglasses oh. that are listed as Ray-Ban and, uh, and scarves that are listed as Versace, you know darn well these are neither Ray-Bans nor Versace. Absolutely, yes. Do you call the police and say, look, they're guilty of fraud and shut down this poor merchant well, I on said grounds of the NAP? Jeff, I just got through agreeing. Again, that's why I have to repeat things twice for a guy like you. I just got through agreeing <laughs> that in the vast majority of cases uh, that where where kooky people try to bring lawsuits something that could happen in any society uh, then indeed obviously the market sorts it out but also as i also said jeff is that is that the toothpaste example was ill chosen now you proceed to choose another bad example what about the jeff tucker a convertible automobile that that retails for forty thousand dollars, and what if it has the picture of Jeff Tucker on the front, on the windshield, and uh, and it's and it's supposed to be according to the specifications of a Jeff Tucker automobile, and you bought this forty thousand dollar automobile, and it turns out that it's a lemon. It it isn't it isn't the Jeff Tucker automobile. The dealership that claims to be part of the Jeff Tucker dealership is not a proper dealership. Then other people who bought that car may bring a lawsuit. So, so that's, I, I and that's say, plausible lawsuit. I, I would course. say I, I'm not I'm not sure about that. Okay. And, and, and the reason okay. I say this At least is, is because Jeff Tucker is not sure for a moment. Good. Okay. No, no. I, and I tell you the reason yeah. is that is yeah. that probably the real brand would sell for four hundred thousand dollars. It's very possible that the person wanted to buy a fake for forty thousand oh, dollars. Oh, yes. oh. And and so how do you know and, and so how are you gonna discern this? You can't uh, knowingly the price, buy the price. a the price, just, just as you said, just as you said, how this case is, is going to be dismissed on summary judgment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you paid forty thousand dollars for a four hundred thousand dollar car, and mm -hmm. you think, and, and we're supposed to think that you thought you were buying a Jeff Tucker right. order? Of course not. So yeah. that's where the mark was sort of. But I do want to, I do want to have a hands across the table about one thing. I'm, I'm actually, of course, quoting citing Stefan Kinsella, who wrote that book, Against Intellectual Property. Oh. Now, now, now Stefan agrees with you and agrees with me mm. uh, about the basic principle, the first principle, which is that Jeff Tucker's mind, his mind, which, which conceived of this wonderful automobile that in your case retails for $40,000 and that if you pay $40,000 for it, you obviously know it's not a Jeff Tucker automobile if it's new. So clearly it's ridiculous to bring a case. But the point is only that Jeff Tucker does not own the product of his mind. Kinsella is only making the point that, and, and, and let me give full ground to your point, that maybe, maybe the consumer has a case of fraud to be brought. But that's very, very different well, from the idea that you, that you have right. intellectual property in your mind, and that's where we agree. Yeah. That's where we agree. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I don't have intellectual property and in, 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 in my reputation. That's as, right. As much as I'd like to. Well, precisely. Give me a clean answer, Gene. Yeah. Is that shop in Istanbul that's selling Nike shoes for $20 each engaged in an act of fraudulent commerce. Well, I would, I would say, I would say that just as I implied that, 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 that if I were on the jury or judging this case, I would say that, that clearly the price was enough of a signal to mm. the consumer that that is not a case of fraud. That gets back to your point mm. that, that, that the market sorts it out. I'm, I'm only dealing with a yeah. pure and those cases can arise. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree with you. But this is actually an extremely important point because we yeah. have police 
uh, you know, the world over that are sweeping these, uh, these uh, uh, yeah. how would you say, we keep calling them fraud, but actually yeah. they're just uh, pirate. Yeah, <coughs> pirate goods and service uh, goods uh, from the street. Well, they're knockoffs. No, no, no. I, 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 like, I, I like I like the point that generic drugs. They're called generic drugs, but actually they're knockoffs. <laughs> the generic drugs are knockoffs of the patented drug, and of course, they, so therefore, a knockoff is a knockoff. Uh, and it's and you know what's funny it's about that? It's yeah, wonderful. I and agree. That, and you know what's interesting about that to me, Gene, is that to, to the to the point that the market sorts sorts this out better than your beloved state. Yeah. Um, the the uh, when I go into the CVS and I and I see um, uh, uh, Bayer aspirin, right. And then right next to it, a package that looks almost identical, but without all the fancy pants stuff yeah. and without the label on it. And it's just called CVS pain reliever. But it's clearly like the shape of the bottle is the mm -hmm. same. It's clearly bare, right? Now, I uh, tell me if you've ever been in this situation. You're standing, and what, one is $5, the other is $2. You're standing there, but with a splitting headache, and you think, wow, $2, that's really attractive. But I really, I really need <laughs> I really need to make darn sure this is going to work. And what do you do? Like an idiot, you go for the for the brand. I've done it many, many times. Now, uh, um, uh, yeah. so they can exist side by side. Yeah. Uh, and here's the other real point here, and I think we're going to probably return to this theme. There doesn't have to be one winner in a market. You know, um, oh. there can be a multiplicity of, of, of products available that are very similarly branded. Uh, one winning doesn't come at the expense of the other. They kind of each market each other. It's not that big a deal. And and I think it does work itself out. Yeah, well, for the most part, it does. Uh, it does. I, I still insist on, on that on that extreme point I made about the potential for fraud, but I absolutely agree with you. Uh, we did have a question about from, a, a clear case of, can you give me a real world case of fraud, uh, and, uh, brand fraud? I, I, I want to hear your real world case of brand, brand fraud that you think is actionable in some way. Well, you know, I I I uh, I, I can't and I, and I and I plead uh, that I can't on the grounds that this thing is so uh, is often so uh, specifically policed that I guess nobody would try it. Uh so and it probably exists. Uh there is a, you know the, but uh, but uh, but I guess I can't. So oh, well, look, if you want to say that that in a way this is completely nobody's really going to try to 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 market a Jeff Tucker automobile for four hundred thousand dollars and pretend it's Jeff Tucker. Yeah. Nobody will even try it. I, That's I'm, fine. A little, That's fine. I'm, I'm bugged. I'm bugged by your fraud language, and 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 because oh, I think it opens up some problems. I mean, like even today, there are are probably thousands and thousands of products being marketed on on Amazon as. The real thing that is not, that are not actually the real thing. Oh yeah, no, no, indeed, yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. As a matter, I, I tell you, I had a shocking, I listened to a shocking interview that Tom Woods conducted with a guy who's now got a website in which he analyzes compounds and other things that are released. I'm trying to remember what some of the products were, and he's found just an, an incredible case yeah. in which that the, the ingredients do not. Re once he analyzes them as chemical compounds, the ingredients do not respond to what oh, or right. what it's called. And, and that in that case, it seems yeah. to yep. me. Uh, it really is up to Amazon to to police itself, and yeah. and and yeah. rather than uh, taking recourse to to the law and to language of fraud and all the rest of it, basically Amazon says, you know, our consumers want to have some sense yeah. that what they're buying is actually the the yeah. real thing, or if it's or if it's labeled as the real thing, it's not really the real thing. It needs to somehow very clearly indicate that this is fake Jeffrey Tucker toothpaste or whatever you know whatever the thing is, whatever the consumer wants. I think I think the market manages this uh, much much better than uh, the law, and and this is actually extremely imp an extremely yeah. important point because yeah. that I mean the, you know you and I both complain about the uh, about the the ex too expansive uh, power of the state, um, and, and the enforcement of of brand trademarks is um, a, a huge uh, excuse for the expansion expansion yeah. uh, yeah. over the last. You know, really, 150 years or something like that. Well, and, 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 and by the way, it never yeah. works, right? I mean, you look at something like Coke. You know, um, you know, as soon as Coca-Cola came out, people figured out how to reverse engineer it. The recipe is not a secret. That's all BS. Uh, so Coke had to come up with innov innovative ways uh, to market itself, and it tried this, it tried this, it started, you know, it started like suing its company. Finally, it came out with this very. They realized that since they couldn't make a distinct cola. 
what they would do is invest a, their their moat around their business was they had a lot of capital. So they invested in a bottle making plant <clears throat> that would make a very fancy, unique bottle that nobody else could replicate. And yeah. and and that's how they were able to signal to the customer that this was the real thing. Was well, I, I, I think I'll, I'll let you, that's interesting. I'll let you mind large have the last word. I, I think that interestingly, that the, the fact that this guy has a website and that he tests things, it, we would all want to subscribe and we'd all want to avoid buying these products rather than bring a lawsuit. And I completely agree with you there. I, I, so you make some good points in this regard, Jeff. I want to move on to trade secrets. And trade secrets, I think, are a little bit uh, uh, more complicated, in my view, they before are. we get to patents and copyrights. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and so maybe you, you, uh, you're you not, and maybe you want to have the first statement about trade secrets. I'm, I'm not good on this topic, Gene, I'll no, warn okay. you, but I will say, in principle, it's... Yeah makes sense to me that as a condition of employment yeah. uh, you, you could be uh, required to keep uh, secrets uh, uh, from from competitors and that if you uh, sold proprietary information from a company to a to a competitor that could actually be illegal illegally actionable um, yeah and when Donald I, and, yeah and that when, sounds it sounds right to me it sounds right to me. In other yeah. words, that trade secrets sh 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 d should exist and do exist. However, let me just say, and again, I've not, and you probably know more about this than me because I, you know, my good friend Stefan Cattell rails against trade secrets also. Wow. Is there some sense in which trade secrets are are not what I just described, uh, purely a matter of contract, but rather are something else? Yeah, well, well, and, and I want to return to the basic principle, which which is where why you and I are uncomfortable, uh, when it comes to brands or, or when it comes to trade secrets, the the point that Kinsella makes, which it, which we as Austrian libertarians are uncomfortable with, is owning the products of your mind rather than owning a physical product, and 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 he makes the point that that what that really means, you know, that that there's ownership in physical products, and th th that could be clearly delimited. But mm -hmm. the idea that of owning the products of your mind, a secret yeah. or a brand, that's Cultures. really really, and then and then he makes the point: doesn't that really imply that other people cannot own physical products that copy your mind? It's just really unsettling to think that we want the power of the law, of, it's not quite apart from the power of the state, limiting that. So that's why. You you and I are going to come about trade secrets. But then, as, as you're saying, uh, I mean, as a matter of fact, of course, the issue should be broadened just to make it current. Uh, that clearly, when Donald Trump uh, used his lawyer to pay hush money to the prostitute who had pleasured him, right. or when, when Bill Clinton was, was spending hush money on, on, uh, on prostitutes to get them to keep quiet about the sexual encounter, uh, then you or, would or, say- Or that every worker at the White House is forced to, uh, to, to sign a non-disclosure, non-disparagement. Yeah. And then, of course, obviously, passing, we, we could get into this business of passing secrets in wartime and then committing treason and getting, mm -hmm. getting but, but let's take the easier case. Jeff Tucker Enterprises, Gene Epstein Enterprises, there's certain secrets. That we have a right, you and I have a right to be secretive about our lives, about anything. And then the question is, if we write a contract, uh, is it enforceable with an employee? Uh, if you leave this firm, you cannot divulge the secret. And then Kinsella, by the way, you're actually mistaken. I mean, I read him more recently than you did just last week. He's he's a little bit uncomfortable about it. He says, all right, I work for Jeff Tucker. Jeff Tucker's got a trade secret about the Jeff Tucker car. And then I, uh, get, I, I leave the employment of mm. Tucker. And then I'm working for another company, a com competitive company. Mm. And I, and I divulge the secret to that company. Mm. And then, and then, uh, then now, now I violated a contract. By the way, it horrifies me to find out that the divulgence of trade secrets can be a criminal offense. I, I think it's okay. that's draconian. So I, I think yeah, that yeah. that's the issue. Yeah. That, that that's the the key problem is yeah. the difference between a, 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 a sort of a, a civil an actual offense that's in the civic civil law where you, you're just entitled, entitled to compensation versus the criminal law. Maybe that's maybe well, that's 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 the real issue we're Well, still about. though, I mean, you look, if you can bring a civil case against them, but, but I want to get to the next part, which is Kinsella says, but then, and 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 of course, Rothbard and others have, have, have issue with this too. So now I tell a third party at that competing company. Okay, so I tell Joe Blow. Now, Joe Blow didn't sign the contract. On the other hand, he's hearing it from me and I violated the contract. But is Joe Blow an accomplice in violating that contract? Uh, you see, take it to the next step. Uh, who, 
who do you sue? Do you, do you do you sue the guy who wrote the contract with you, or do you do you also sue all the people who who hear the secret and and Kinsella actually almost throws up his hands and says, "Well, is this person an accomplice or not?" And uh, and and he actually has right. difficulty with this one. Yeah, so yeah. so I've got you to resolve it for me, Jeff. Yeah, I don't I don't know, and this is a complicated and also the same, yeah. I think I think he really put his finger on it—the criminal versus civil. Yeah, like well, I, th I think Apple has dealt with this problem in the past. Uh, yeah. Where uh, where its employees have divulged uh, secrets of the up upcoming you know new edition of the iPhone, I think that happened between five and six, something yeah. like that. And sure enough, the criminal law got involved, and yeah. and I think that's where we should have an argument. Uh, this is not all right. Well, okay, but still, it's uncomfortable to be even to bring a civil case to bring a civil case against third and fourth parties who hear the secret. Yeah. And then on top of that, if you actually and then the, and, but then if you read. The, it actually, if you re read these little websites like from lawyers.com that want to inform you on these things if you want to sue. So they even they they even say, on the other hand, if if Joe Blow thought up the idea himself and didn't hear it as a secret, yeah. then yeah, my God, you know the very thing that, you're talking about that is re that is fascinating. Yeah, well, it, that is and, probably a more it, common case. Yeah, yeah, and and in fact, in that case, the yeah. invocation of this trade secret uh, law. Would would be a case of intellectual monopoly. I mean, basically, yeah, yeah. you're saying I thought of this. This is why yeah. nobody else is allowed to think yeah. of it independently. That's where we get into real right. right. And, and then, and see, this is the irony. Richard Epstein, and no relation, but uh, quote, quote, quite a guy and a little bit crazy, but brilliant as well. He wrote his only really good, his best book is called Simple Rules for a Complex World. And he's writing as a lawyer, and he's saying, look, a complex world needs simple rules. You don't want rules that bring up so many cans of worms that you make lawyers rich. You don't want rules that 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 that, that attract the lunatics who want to bring nuisance lawsuits. So I think that even though Richard Epstein, by the way, is all for or this intellectual property thing, yes. he would be arguing with. We could use his basic principle against him. I guess the, so, yeah. the point is that 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 perhaps the trade secret thing then it becomes one of those cases in which it's a complex rule. It gets into such such a can of worms having to do with claims and counterclaims, getting lawyers rich and keeping courts and judges busy. That maybe maybe we want to avoid it maybe you want to yeah. say that the only per maybe you your position is probably uh, that that if i leave and i violate the and and i and i uh, divulge the secret you can sue me but you can't sue the rest of the people so that, that's, that's probably right and if somebody else comes up with it independently yeah then then you've got no actionable uh, case the the whole point yeah. is to avoid legally enforceable monopolies <laughs> yeah right? well yeah well yes indeed well indeed well the point is though certainly certainly uh, you know that that I signed the contract and I and I was developed and I was privy to the secret. So there's evidence there. But the point is that clearly you have to be un uncomfortable in, in in accepting the idea that that uh, uh, that this is a secret. I said I'm going to keep the secret so you can sue me and I can be harmed certainly in civil court and punished in civil court at least uh, for violating the secret. So you're you're taking that position and in a way it's almost the best compromise. But uh, but those to whom I divulge the secret too much of a can of worms to indict them to go after them as well. Now so, you br you brought up the case of of, <coughs> of Trump and and China and and that China sort of, which, uh, Trump and, and, and yeah Trump, he's always Trump going and, on Trump and the strumpet the Trump and 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 the, and the porn oh, star. Oh, you brought up that. Oh, okay, sexual, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. You did. I thought you were going to bring up the China case because you know. Well, he's, go ahead. Bring. He's yes. always accusing uh, China of of stealing our trade secrets. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. but once you dig into it more deeply, yeah. what you find is that yeah. the companies that are doing business in China have have shared their uh, intellectual property as a condition of uh, of, of opening uh, factories and plants and, and yeah, yeah. making contracts and complex fine supply chains in, in China. It, th this is the, they're doing this on their own. It's yeah. the, China is not stealing anything from anybody. Yeah. Now, maybe the companies in question, whether it's iPhone or somebody else, would rather not do this and and would like to have the power <laughs> of the U.S. state brought against the government of China to force uh, China to stop insisting on such terms, but and I, in that case, I think it's just a, a clear case of government overreach. I mean, yes. uh, yeah. it's, uh, 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 there is such a thing as uh, 
intellectual property imperialism, uh, yeah, I think, absolutely. going on here. I, I, want, I want to go back. I saw a question flash the screen, and I, I wanted to add, I, I think it has something to do with Bitcoin. You were making, I want to revert to one point because we should keep it up to date. The Bitcoin people want to be heard from. I, I said, I claimed that I talked about fraud in Bitcoin, and you and I. My reaction would have been to you if it's called it's called Bitcoin Cash. Uh, this is a, a very savvy uh, group of consumers, <clears throat> so the idea that they can be defrauded is too unlikely for me to accept. Okay. Though, so, what, but what's your your position is that as well, right? Yeah, yeah. It, I just, you know, just I, 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 it was funny to me the way you presented it because it, the way you put <laughs> it up and, and probably very naively and 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 Gene Epstein is, is nothing if not naive. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I thought you were preparing uh, a, a, little, a little brief against Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Private, all these other. <clears throat> well, no, they're signaling again. They're signaling. Well, no, no, you, <clears throat> you, you raised a good question, which is how often does the really pure case of fraud arise <clears throat> where somebody is saying this is really the Col Colgate toothpaste? Unlikely, and oh. indeed, you're you're saying that in the vast majority of cases, the market sorts it out. The signals yeah. are clear. This is yeah. this is a knockoff. No. It's not the thing itself. But I yeah. so but I wanted to mention there was a question about Bitcoin and the forking, and Jeff yeah. and I agree that the, really yeah. there has been. But, wrong. but hey, Gene, and, let's let's not pass over this too lightly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I disagree with this with this analysis. But here's what yeah. here's what Bitcoin <clears throat> and Bitcoin Core would say. Yeah. We're we're in an early stage of adoption. Yeah. Uh, consumers are famously in this sector, famously uh, ignorant, right? And oh, and they oh. hear that they should be owners of Bitcoin or something like that. So of <clears> course <throat> they go to Coinbase, which by the way has filed a whole series of, of patents, which we can get to. Yeah. But they go to Coinbase and they're like, okay, I want to buy Bitcoin. One Bitcoin is $6,000. Uh, another Bitcoin is $500. And, yeah. and the naive customer goes, well, I just want Bitcoin. Uh, I guess I'll buy the cheaper one. So, so, so the people accusing the fork of of being basically an act of of, of brand stealing uh, fraud are are trying to put their themselves in the minds of these consumers who are are basically confused. Yeah, and, and so that's their case. I don't really agree with it. Um, uh, but 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 it's not as crazy as we might be tempted to make it sound. Well, yeah, no, okay, no, I, I, I think that case is a fraud. Again, I trust Jeff that you agree that 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 cases of fraud can exist, and fraud can be a case of violating the non-aggression principle. Can it can be? Are we on the same page so far? Yeah, Jeff? yeah, yeah. Before and, you go, I, okay, okay. Then yeah. therefore, we have to admit that while we want simple rules for a complex world, fraud. Uh, the, the fraudulence of the contra uh, of, of what was represented has to be very clear and very self-evident. And you're saying that maybe, maybe you got a case in certain cases. In that certain cases, but you know, let me tell you something really quickly here. I I love to give Bitcoin to people, you know, in yeah. small amounts. Yeah. And as you probably well know, that stopped being basically possible, at least not reliably so, yeah. in about 2017 yeah. for, for 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 Bitcoin canonical, I guess we yeah. say Bitcoin core. The, the the first Bitcoin. And so so now, you know, when I, I encounter people all the time, they're like, what is this Bitcoin thing? And, I, and so, uh, so I say, well, let me give you some. And so I'll give them Bitcoin Cash because it's it's it moves faster and it's vastly cheaper to send. It's just much easier, much more reliable. And I can send two boxes without paying three, as happened to me one time <laughs> with Bitcoin Core. So I, I give them Bitcoin Cash, but and and I and I will say it's Bitcoin cat, but but you know at an early stage of adoption, most consumers aren't going to sit and listen to a lecture about forks and mm -hmm. branding yeah. and this and that. So in most cases, these people go away from me thinking that they got what they call a Bitcoin, but in fact it was Bitcoin Cash. Now I've never felt a sense of guilt about that. Now in a couple of cases, um, what happened was that. Person took to the internet and to to Twitter, which you know is a as this is a, oftentimes a toxic environment, and said, "Oh, look, here's my great uh, Jeffrey Tucker just gave me Bitcoin. Here's my public address. Send me Bitcoin." And then it's a it's an address for Bitcoin Cash. And next thing you know, they've got two thousand tweets flying at them. Tucker robbed you. He sold you a fraudulent Bitcoin. He is full of crap. You know, uh, that's not Bitcoin. That's a fake Bitcoin. And the person is like, what is going on? You know, they just have no idea that, yeah. that there's these kinds of splits, that there's trolling. 
and they get inundated with this crap. And then they walk away going, well, I guess these Bitcoin people are just basically insane. I mean, it's well, really off-putting. Well, well, okay. I, I, I do. I think that if I were, I, if I was a defense attorney, uh, if being in the case, these people, I would say that there's only a certain level of understanding that they that should be required of the ordinary person. Maybe there's a case of fraud. I, I, I will briefly list three cases that have been respected, having to do with, let's say, fraud or harm. And that was, first of all, the case of the woman who poured the hot coffee on herself and sued McDonald's, even though McDonald's had all kinds of warnings, this coffee is too hot. A, a second case is a people who sue McDonald's for getting fat. Now, clearly, you see evidence if you go to McDonald's frequently, your body expands, and therefore, you should be expected to know that McDonald's is not trying to imply that you get thin by eating those shake, the shakes and, and, and the Big Mac. So I think I would throw that case out. And the more subtle, the other case of the people who said, we didn't know that smoking causes cancer, I would point out to them that the Reader's Digest, which went into like 50 million homes, the, 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 the people who ran it, I forget that the Wallaces, they they were writing articles in the 1930s on how it causes cancer, oh. how it's bad for you. So, so therefore, you should have been. Oh, you, can, you, can, you can go to the very er, er, origin of, of popular writing in like the 16th century. Uh, well, 16th century. God. And, okay. And, anyway. So, but so those. So even. So I. I claim. I'm more or less on your side. But I can imagine Bitcoin gets a little complicated. I. Uh, we should get to. I think. I think actually the more difficult cases of patents and copyrights. Yeah. Those are the two remaining cases. Now I want to mention i want to mention uh rothbard's solution uh i assume you're aware of it it, it actually I, I didn't quite remember it in its particulars because he even wants some property rights and patents although copyrights he thinks are open and shut so rothbard stipulates mm -hmm. being lawyer like in his mind that of course you don't want the state there but what you do if you and i write a book and then every copy that's sold it specifically says cannot be copied this cannot be copied. And then and then if you invent a machine, then you put on it cannot be copied. Now, Rothbard admits that very uh, that in the case of patented products where it looks the same but it's not precisely the same, difficult to enforce, but even says maybe it's okay in certain cases. If you invent a wheel, the concept of the wheel, you're the first guy who invented the wheel. Now now there's that now that has to be copied in its exactitude. So you say, "Hey, look, this cannot be copied, so you have protection. Sim but, but then Rothbard, being a writer, perhaps says, well, in the case of something you've written down, then, then it's enforceable. It says, I, Murray Rothbard, have written this book. It cannot be copied. This is part of the contract. And therefore, uh, and, and therefore, obviously, if you copy it word for word, the violation of that copyright is clear. So he's only saying that these are enforceable contracts the way you stipulate uh, that uh, that that uh, it cannot be copied. So that's where Rothbard would protect these intellectual property rights. And what's your reaction? Uh, I, I'll, I'll react to that by asking you a question. Let's yeah. say you you go to the grocery store and there's a there's a, a bin of potatoes. Yeah. Potatoes. <laughs> okay. And the potatoes are, uh, say these are for potatoes au gratin. Yeah. Okay. And um, so you're like, mm -hmm. okay. So you get them home. You're looking at those potatoes and going, you know. I think I think I'm gonna turn them into French fries or or, uh, or actually just mashed potatoes. <laughs> Jeff, are you going off the deep end? Are you talking about our earlier cases of fraud and misrepresentation? No, I'm talking about this copyright thing. I'm well, just saying. Can't you deal with a book? You are now the owner of the potato. Are uh, you bound by the sign that you saw at the grocery store that said all consumers can only make potatoes on ground? Are you legally bound to respect? the terms oh, oh, now that you are the owner of the freaking potato this is oh, your oh, potato oh well, and well why well, do you say no yeah i said oh i said oh okay but you see what i mean right you've got a you've got a contract you you, you made a contract with kroger that you're not going to make mashed potatoes out of these potatoes you're going to make potatoes au gratin it's no different from a book that says if you buy this, you can't copy it. Wait a minute, you get it home, it's your book. You can use it for firewood. Rothbard would stipulate that if you want to buy Man, Economy, and State by Murray Rothbard and 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 put and put it in your furnace or put it in your in your fireplace, he can't prevent you from doing that. He so Jeff, so that's why your example is just not that good. No, you don't it's have to read the book. 
you, you, it's just that you cannot allow okay so let's change the example jeff, so the Kroger please, says, jeff, please fo focus on a book jeff tucker's book jeff tucker you, you've been it's your book you published a book okay and then you and, and he says jeff tucker says you cannot copy this book and so so rothbard then by the way says that that means that you can read it but you cannot duplicate it because that was the kind then he says that then then if you allow somebody else you can't sell the rights to duplicate to anybody else because because you can't sell any more rights than you've bought okay. and then but then, then this gets back, by the way, the crazy basic thing. And, and how many people do we sue? And how many people? I mean, I think it gets very oh, messy. Okay, but, let's you know, let's let's stick with your book and book case. Book, and, of course, and get, obviously, a lot of people who write books are bothered by this. You write a song. You write. Can it be duplicated? And yeah, I get to sing it. No. Okay. Uh, by the way, one of the funniest things about Atlas Shrugged is, is pretty funny because you remember there's this. Well, my God. Uh, there's this. I'm... There's this. This composer who's who's the, one of the guys who went off to uh, Galt's Gulch, right? And he's got I don't know. Remember which symphony it is? The Seventh Symphony, and I forget his name now. But some guys like whistling the Seventh Symphony on the subway, and uh, you know the, the the girl, the hero of the book, hears it and goes, Ah, oh, so. You know, there's the seventh. So as I'm reading this, because I'm so scrupulous about this IP point, I'm realizing, oh wow, you whistle that that symphony on the subway, you're violating the rights of that composer, yeah. technically, yeah. according to copyright. Yeah. Um, let's let's take and the. I, I read, probably would have sued you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anyway, so in other words, I, a really um, a clever plot twist in her book yeah. it turns on the violation of of rights according to her terms, and yeah. she doesn't even know it. But she, uh, so, those. No, no, she was an absolute rock rib believer in property rights and everything she wrote and every song she wrote or whatever else she did. And uh, if she had invented the wheel, no doubt that she would have said for the next 2,000 years, nobody can duplicate my wheel. And probably is what she, she, she went I, further. I, she, even, she even said that, that intellectual property rights are the foundation of all property rights. Yeah. Uh, that more they're more important than property rights in physical book, but uh, physical property. But let's return to the book yeah, thing. Let's yeah. say, I buy I buy the book that on the first page says don't copy this as a condition of reading it. And you're like, oh, okay. But then I tear out the first page where it says that and I leave it on a park bench. Yeah. Yeah. And well, so I actually, actually, it actually actually you're anticipating Stephen Molyneux's point that you have two books on a park bench, one of them has the, it, it it sounds Stephen Molyneux I mean, or Stephen Kinsella? Sorry, Kinsella. <laughs> I'm confusing my Stefans, those guys with this crazy name. But anyway, but anyway, yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, that, that no, that it 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 gets it does get into a can of worms. And 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 uh, I think we should first now we should certainly have a moment to talk about open source software. We should talk about yeah, yeah. all the all the practice. I mean, we should oh. get practical. I want to make a couple of practical points yeah. before you get to that. That indeed, uh, the, the, the point that's been made in against intellectual monopoly, the other book, is that is that so much of what really developed uh, on the internet for a long time uh, before Microsoft came along uh, was indeed uh, open source software. It's got a long history, and there are so many people now. Who are basically putting it out? Open source software means no copyright. There's no no protection. You can copy this, and of course, perhaps people don't realize that that Satoshi's program for Bitcoin, which got improved on vastly, which he wanted to get improved on vastly, all open source. Yes. That's why the forking happens. That's why this cryptocurrency, and that's why this thing has flourished. A lot of people have gotten fabulously rich from it. What's to complain about? Preacher Murray brother Rothbard. Why? Preach, yeah. Preacher brother, that's exactly right. Um, I, I, and 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 of course, the, the software patents weren't even enforceable in the 1970s. That's one of the yeah. reasons that that database yeah. technology yeah. took off because uh, because it was never enforced by by patents. But on the copyright point, let me just say this. And I'll, 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 it's something that might intrigue you. And sometimes when we have these conversations, I always like to imagine I'm sitting next to you at dinner and I love to talk to you over dinner. But if I was over at dinner with you and you and I had a couple of drinks and you said to me something like, what's the, what's the, from a professional point of view, what's the best thing you ever did? I would answer you um, that uh, I, 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 Everything I've ever written in my adult life has been published in the commons, with with very few exceptions, mm -hmm. and that has been great uh, because it's allowed me to take to keep control of my own writings. Now that sounds like like a contradiction in a way. It's like, wait, it's in the commons. How can you keep control of it? The point is that if it's in the in the commons, then you're you're not surrendering the rights to distribute your work to a publisher. 
Mm -hmm. That's well, that's that's extremely important. And to me, it's one of the tragedies of, of modern intellectual life that even after all these years of we have Creative Commons license, we know the errors of copyright, we've seen uh, you know, a half century of literature practically burned and destroyed because of copyright. Even now, regular academics are still using, uh, uh, kind of forced into conventional copyright models. Uh, as a matter of getting tenure, they have to publish with, you know, whatever Princeton University Press, or University of Chicago Press, and, and, and they lose control of their own works for their entire lifetime plus 70 years. And, and it's sad, a lot of these guys say, oh no, I retain my copyrights. Bullshit. What, look at the contract. You might retain the copyright, but it's just uh, that's just a word we use. Who has the distribution rights? Those belong to the publisher, not to you. I consider this a violation of human rights. Oh wow! Okay. And anybody who continues to do this, and and I'm sure, you, by the way, your book is under the same situation. So uh, you're gonna have to wait to your to your grandkids or middle age before uh, they'll ever be able to repent your book in the commons. And to me, that is just pathetic and sad and and really evil. Well, uh, well, I, I hadn't thought of that uh, that wrinkle and angle. I, I, I do, I do want to uh, bring up, uh, uh, mention what uh, what Stephen Kinsella uh, pointed out. Uh, certainly, uh, there are, on the other hand, a lot of writers who say, "Look, I want to make a living from my writing." Uh, we might, we could make the point that Charles Dickens complained about the fact that he didn't have copyright protection in the United he States. Did. On the other hand, on the other hand, the guy made. I know from the biographies I read of him because I love to read about him uh, that he made the equivalent of a million bucks doing readings around the U.S. of his book books. So therefore, he was greatly helped by the fact that the books were issued as freebies, uh, not really free freebies from his standpoint. Uh, but he his fame preceded him, and he could do readings. Well, he was, he was like the Grateful Dead, right? I mean, uh, giving yeah. away the music for free and charging for the concert. Charging for, yeah, and, and then and then he makes, uh, there's another very good point that uh, that Kinsella makes, uh, which is that uh, if Jeff Tucker wants to make some money from his book or anybody else with any kind of name, go into crowdsource, go into go to website and say, and say, I'm about to issue a book. If you want a copy of it overnight, send me five bucks and the, that, that, that therefore obviously the, the consumers are not going to be able to organize you get five bucks send five bucks in the mail you can before it's published and you can get a copy of his book you, and, and stephen king can do the same thing and of course make far more money from this uh, and so there are lots of ways for people to make a money make money from uh from 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 writing books very few books. people do though and yeah. and and every oh, yes. it's yeah. fascinating to me yeah. You know, every, every writer is just so anxious to flatter himself or herself. You know, they yeah. they enter into these royalty contracts yeah. that are contingent upon uh, giving away the distribution rights to some big shop publisher, and they always imagine themselves to be the next New York Times bestseller, and they're going to get rich. And that happens less often than you win the lottery. Well, yes, and you could probably do just as well by just uh, getting a name for yourself and issuing. Uh, and I mean, you might, you might, it, it, somebody who buys it has a physical copy or has some, uh, buys a copy online of your book, gets a special code and, and has the right to ask you two questions about your book. It, it oftentimes, if it's enough, lots of ways to make money, probably very, in these days, more money than you can make through it, through an established publisher. I do want to add, Hopefully, conclude. That's probably right. Yeah, I yeah, think that's yeah. probably right. You can publish uh, on on your own, yeah. uh, and, and and put it uh, Creative Commons. And uh, by the way, it's it's not inconsistent. This is a common mistake. You you and I, by arguing for the abolition of intellectual property right, uh, intellectual property, yeah. legally enforceable intellectual property, like I think you and I are doing, that is not to say we're 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 against profits, right? No. Oh, I well. mean, I, if I I could I could publish. Um, a transcript of this conversation uh, on 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 Amazon and have people uh, download it as an ebook and 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 label it as Creative Commons so that anybody can reproduce it uh, you know all over the world. That doesn't forbid me from charging people for downloading our canonical edition. They, those yeah. are not inconsistent. Just because you know we're not arguing against profiting off your ideas, we're just uh, arguing against using the course of power of the state to create a monopoly. In those ideas, as a way of of extracting rents from consumers, uh, uh, yes. in a way that's inconsistent with market by, economics. By analogy, by the way, I recently encountered a deal where I I, I emailed a very well known person 
in uh, in the bit in the blockchain uh, industry to ask him if he'd debate in my solo forum. So I found that there's a new there's a now a vendor that says that uh, you uh, you put you post a card or, or whatever, and if he responds to you, then we charge you twenty bucks. No, we don't. We, if he doesn't respond to you in six days, then you charge nothing. But if he does respond, then then it's twenty bucks. So he obviously they get a piece of it. You get a piece. Of it. So of course you know. The, to me or to you, Jeff, I don't know if people would pay 20 bucks to hear from us, but you or I probably have to charge two bucks, but then again, we might make it up on volume. You know, and, and, and I don't know if you've thought about this, uh, Gene, uh, the way we use our language, yeah. Yeah. but we often say that we're downloading a book from Amazon or we're downloading a, a movie from Netflix. And and I love the language that, that Amazon uses on its movies. You can rent it yeah. or you can buy it. Of course, we do need to understand that this is all metaphor. It's all just ways that they're talking to us that make sense in our stupid lizard brains yeah. because these are all infinite goods. There's an infinite quantity of movies out there. There's an infinite quantity of books. And I don't mean distinct movies. I mean like each individual movie has potentially infinite number of copies. Yeah. You're not actually buying uh, the movie. You're not actually buying the book. What you're doing is purchasing the scarce good of the downloadable service. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, okay. This gets into obviously movies still. It's it, it much cheaper to make a movie than it used to be. Uh, the capitalist technology has made it possible for many, many people to make movies who couldn't before. The, the cameras are very cheap and wonderful. So, but it does still cost a lot of money to make a movie, and so we have to figure out ways for people to get their money back. Absolutely. To get remunerated. And and, uh, and 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 having a, a delivery service that yeah. people want to pay for. That's a great solution. I remember uh, 15 years ago, people used to argue with me, uh, or 10 years ago, really. Oh, you could never have movies put in the commons because there would be no model for profitability. Well, guess what? The market figured out one. Well, they could no. maybe they could just a moment, Jeff. Uh, I hadn't thought of this one. So, but if the movie's out, then I could do a copy and I could sell. I could sell copies. I could do knockoffs of the movie. Wouldn't that be possible? I could copy the movie. Can I duplicate it? What isn't that a problem, Jeff? In a word, yes. No, I mean, in a word, no, it's not a problem. Yes, you can do that. Why isn't it, why isn't it a problem? Well, because it goes on every single second, every day, all around the world. I mean, there's no movie that, if, if a brand new movie was released in theaters tonight, theaters. I can promise you yeah. that by midnight, I could, I could download a, a copy online. I could probably stream it or uh, torrent it online and this goes on every single day. They are available in the streets of New York. Well, yeah. I, I actually wanted to deal with the most difficult. See, oddly enough, we haven't spoken uh, that much in the time we've taken about uh, blockchain technology, Bitcoin software, because by and large, that's a kind of, I mean, despite the disputes in the patent, well, the patents are obviously uh, are basically destructive. I just wonder if anybody out there disagrees with us. The patents have not been good. They, 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 and there's so many, so many easy cases to show uh, the flourishing of open source software. Oh, okay, actually, which, and open source everything, like yeah. recipes you can't patent. There are still recipe books at the store. By the way, you know how they got around that? Because you go to the store, right? And or you go to Amazon, you want to learn how to cook like uh, an Iraqi or whatever, yeah. <laughs> whatever the thing is. Um, or my, I have a Jerusalem cookbook that I bought. The reason we buy these things is because of the beautiful pictures, not the recipes. The recipes are in the comments. Yeah. You, can't, you can't even now copyright a recipe, but you can put together a beautiful physical product with you know, great pictures. Of yeah, no, that's actually, actually, I, I do have to put in this this favorite story of the guys who wrote against intellectual monopoly. The, this company, I have it written down here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, they were the first company to, to 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 develop the amazing idea of putting luggage on wheels. I knew you were going to say that. And they're and they're still operating. Uh, they they they're still selling their product. And I don't know. I mean, actually, it's not explained why they didn't try to patent it. They they recognize full well that once the product. Uh, started to sell, everybody would see it in, in airports and it would get copied right away. And oh, yeah. they're still flourishing. They still made millions from that's it. Right. And, and that's and same with same with the Croc, Croc shoes. Remember those Croc yeah. shoes? You probably yeah. hate them. If I know you, you hate Croc shoes. Or maybe you love them. I don't remember. <laughs> I, you know, you, maybe you're the kind of guy who loves Croc shoes. Yeah, yeah. The humanity okay. is split between pro oh, and yeah, Croc. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. they patented it. And I remember the time thinking, you're not going to get away with this. Anything yeah. is popular. People are going to copy. Sure enough, within two, so there's like they're suing everybody, suing everybody. Yeah. And then, and then two years later, 
you know, croc-like things were everywhere, all over Walmart, and, and not made by the croc company. It was basically the same thing. And the croc company faced a huge uh, problem. Yeah. That they, it turns out that it wasn't enough to make one stupid waffle-looking shoe. They had to make a whole variety of shoes. So they got creative and innovative and started putting out uh, you know, more products, more colors, more mm -hmm. designs, and uh, got profitable again. They got profitable not because of the enforcement of their intellectual property rights, but because they became innovative. That's the key to winning in this world. Not well, and, right, right. And and actually, in this vast subject, we we could dwell at because and, and again, especially the the book against intellectual um, monopoly dwells on this. Uh, the whole history of all the harm that's been done. By the copyright and patent, especially oh. the patent industry, the, the way the way in which James Watt, the famous guy, the, the Watson named yes. after him, but he he used patent law to slow progress down. People use patent law all the time to slow progress down, and progress has been slowed in the internet yeah. so because of uh, another uh, example is as as that bastard Eli Whitney, as yeah. we used to put it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Re remind me what? Oh, he used he he, he had the cotton gin. gin. He claimed yeah, it, I know the cotton gin. But... He invented the cotton gin, but it's actually his his uh, his wife. Uh, so did he, he slow pro he, he slow progress down? What did he do? Well, he he added a little flap to the machine or something like that, and then spent years going around the country uh, suing people for ginning cotton with with machines other than his own. Oh, wow. and, and he ended up, you know, being bankrupt. And I think later in life, story went into the gun parts industry and gave up on patent enforcement because they found it was stupid. But then the Wright brothers the same way. I mean, you know, they were granted a, a a a patent for 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 their for their airplane thing um, uh, by the U.S. government and and delayed uh, 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 technology and airplane yeah. technology yeah. for for uh, 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 two decades. So by the time World War One came along, U.S. Didn't have any decent planes. We had to buy all our planes for France. Yeah, well, the, the, the Wright brothers, uh, amazingly, both heroes and villains. Because obviously, the, the, the way these bicycle mechanics. Well, I was recently told that bicycle mechanics all over the country were working on airplanes. But the way these two bicycle mechanics went to an island and and did wind tunnel tests, and at the same time, the, the government funded Smithsonian was trying to launch planes that kept crashing. Oh, into, I know. Into the, and, 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 yeah, those yeah. guys were incredible. But you indeed, know, they it, became it, villains it, later on. Yeah. You're you're kind of fascinated by things like economic measurement and and how do you measure the cost yeah. of things. This is a really interesting case because it's almost impossible to measure the cost of, of the, uh, the delays of development that have been caused by patents. I mean, because as Bastiat said, you're necessarily talking about unrealized wealth. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the costs yeah, yeah. are necessarily yeah. unseen. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. and oh, it's yeah. also especially kind of wicked the way the patent office works because historians you know, trying to find an easy way to discover the history of technology, they always go to the patent office. They're like, oh, the light bulb was invented here. Oh, the phonograph is invented here. This is the telephone thing. And and they look who owns the patent and give all credit to the patent owner. I and mean, this might be completely wrong so far as we know, but it's 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 what we do. Oh, I agree, oh, no, this one, I agree with you completely. The, 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 the evidence of things unseen yeah. of course, is, is, is most applicable to all the entrepreneurial and innovative talent that's squelched when we don't allow the immigrants in or when, when we treat certain, when society treats certain groups as, as subservient when all, and or when patents uh, protection stifles innovation. We don't know what fantastic things could have happened. Uh, and so it's beyond measurement, absolutely. But so I want to return, I want gene, to- To that gene, I have to say, sursum corda, which is Latin for lifts my heart. Yeah. I hear you quoting St. Paul. Oh, sorry, okay. But I, I quote, how did I quote St. Paul? <laughs> Evidence of things unseen. Oh, that was him? Okay, I thought that was Bastian. But anyway, but- but uh, but uh, but I want to I want to end. I think we're I think we're running out of time. Naomi doesn't want us to operate for more than hours. So we have to end on what seems to be the most difficult case, uh, which is that patented drugs. Uh, and uh, and and it, it's interesting that uh, Tom Palmer, libertarian, w is against intellectual property, but he admitted that they were a hard case. And he said, "Well, one case doesn't make the case anyway." But he really sort of backed off about patented drugs. Very difficult. And even the intellectual monopoly guys 
uh, against the drug monopoly. We're very worried about that one as well. And uh, and uh, I do want to address that in a couple of ways. Yeah. Uh, the, the first uh, to say that 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 uh, that clearly the the double blind clinical trials and all the limitations and all the costs imposed by the federal uh, uh, food and drug administration pro very likely kill. Uh, more people than lives they they probably sacrifice more lives than they save because there are five and ten year delays in bringing out life saving drugs and and those delays cost lives uh, and there should be even if the FDA operates there should be it should be optional the most egregious case of course was when gay people were rebelling against the FDA at the time that drugs that now that now can keep you alive, uh, even if you have a condition, uh, even if you, I forget the terminology, even if you are, uh, and you're not, you don't have AIDS, but you are susceptible, that, that drugs could keep, they said, bring these drugs out, we're gonna be dead before you approve them. So, so that happened. So therefore, if the FDA would only abolish itself or back off, the market would sort itself out with respect to developing drugs and having people take chances on whether they wanna take a life-saving drug or not. That would make a huge difference for the drug industry right. to begin with. But but I want to make one for, one, one for that point, which is that which is that uh, Peter Huber in particular has written about this in uh, the Cure in the Code that really the FDA is an anachronism anyway. It, it's it's an historical argument, no longer a present day argument because because real drugs and medications are going to be targeted to individuals through DNA and really the whole thing about the clinical trials and all the time and expense it takes to, to bring out a drug that's going to be really off the table and the FDA really should change its ways in that regard. Third and finally. It gets back in a way to the Rothbardian point. If you feel that not enough is being done to do to achieve certain ends, like not enough is being done to feed people, to, to, to help hungry people abroad, to uh, to bring out drugs that are costly, to fund research, to fund universities, <clears throat> donate there's a lot of the, the philanthropic dollar can be sold big time on things that really need to be done and and if this is a problem with drugs the philanthropic dollar will probably gravitate to it because they love to fund research and, and that, they, let me just, first of all I love absolutely everything you just said and I have nothing to add to it and it's exactly right um, but we should be very clear for anybody who's listening who thinks oh Gene Gene and, and Jeffrey are, are just condemning anybody who, who, who gets a patent um, the vast majority of patents these days are taken out defensively. Yeah. Uh, in other words, you have to do it as a way of, first of all, uh, venture capital these days and investors, they want to see evidence of your, your patent, uh, chat, uh, your, your war chest or whatever you want to call it, uh, patents. There's that. You, you simply can't get investors money unless you unless you've built a, a moat a patent moat around your business model which is tragic to me and evil but the other thing is that you know you so, so oftentimes you patent things to prevent yourself from being shut down later by somebody else yeah. who 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 comes later and patents you and retroactively accuses you of violating uh, uh, patents I mean I, when coinbase took out a, a patent for its technology uh, blockchain technology, it specifically said that it said we are not going to use this aggressively we're only using this to guarantee our right to innovate and to produce yeah. and I, I get that yeah. and and so we should be clear about this this is not an attack on people who seek pro, uh, patents or uh, uh, or yeah. companies that companies that are looking for them and and the way to heaven is not you know always just to issue this because because we're we're in a, a complicated legal environment where you you're sort of more or less forced to get patents as a, as a as a way of permitting you the liberality to actually do the business you want to do. Yeah, um, Jeff, that was well said. And uh, I know me usually flashes a please shut up, guys. Now, uh, but I haven't seen it. I, I noticed from the time that we've taken um, uh, more than an hour as people. Yeah, we should, we should, we should, we should wrap it up. And and now me, there's there she is. more and it issues. And it's just, just basically, this is intellectual property, the product of your mind. It's in the ether. Uh, Murray Rothbard basically said that you don't own your own reputation because the reputation, it, you, the, your reputation exists in the minds of others, and you don't own their minds. Uh, and uh, and similarly, your 
ideas. You don't own your ideas. Your ideas, are, you own your own mind. But once your ideas go out there, you don't own them. They're in the minds of others. So, and you don't own other people's minds. You don't own other people's physical property. And in a way, that really sums up the whole idea of intellectual property. Uh, I spoke to David Friedman, uh, uh, who actually makes a utilitarian, and he actually said with passion. But when you work on some great idea, isn't it great to own it? Well, you know, again, that that that's a nice sentiment, but it's but it's a matter of right. It's great to own it. Well, I would, I would, say, right I would say you do own it, and so does everybody else. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, and, and so we've summed it up well. So Jeff, uh, Naomi, back to you. Uh, we're I, gonna I'm back. I uh, I didn't flash the signs because every time I always I always put in a message that's like wrap it up sometime in the next ten minutes. And as soon as you see it, you're always like mid sentence. You're like, oh, oh we have to end it immediately. I'm like, oh, no. You know, I'm Okay. Point. Well, so I right. just let you guys continue because it's so wonderful just hearing you talk. Anyone okay. didn't catch? So the last live stream that they did talking about Bitcoin and the value of Bitcoin was it was just tremendous. Yeah. All of their talks about Bitcoin have been so wonderful. And I actually did like a quick video afterwards saying that this is basically a case study for how to have an intellectual conversation with someone that you disagree with. Because both of you, you you're never on the same page with a lot of these things. You both have a libertarian Austrian economics foundation, and yet you're always debating nuances and you vehemently disagree with each other on, on so much. Well, exactly, and that's just, why we hate each other. But I, I have yeah, to concede, absolutely. No, I wait, have to concede see, before, one point. Before you jump in, I'm, sure, I sure. might mute you uh, if you keep doing that. So, you know, it's my prerogative to, to speak over you. Um, I, I just want to give a compliment to you both because I just think it's so wonderful to see you disagree on all these issues, but be able to discuss them in this wonderful, intelligent, informed way Way that is fun and you always take jabs at each other which is always hilarious to watch but you also are so open-minded and always hold out the um, possibility that you could be wrong on something and you're always learning from each other so I just want to thank you both so much for making this just the best high-level conversation I have all week and uh, for tab, sharing this I've with my stream. i text from a lot of people telling me that so that's you, 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 yeah you, you, you said it well Naomi and uh, sorry I can't I can't uh, interrupting Madam Brockwell who runs this show absolutely a, a, yeah you can't do that but but I, I, I do want to acknowledge it, that thinking back on every session I've had with Jeff, uh, including this one, I, I do come away uh, having modified my views to some extent after speaking to Jeff. That's so awesome. That's I, the I, highest I comment I can possibly <laughs> I feel the same way. Thank you, Jean. Oh, it's it's, uh, it's so wonderful, and uh, thank you to everyone for sure. participating in the the stream today. Thank you to everyone who used the super chat. That's just absolutely awesome. It all goes to um, towards the channel and just creating even more content for you all. So thank you for that. Sure. We do have an after party in the high jinks and high tea room on Telegram. If you wanted to hop in there, and we can chat about what Jeffrey and, and Gina said. Jeffrey and Gina, are you in my Telegram group? <laughs> Uh, I don't think so. Nobody invited me. I have no All way. Right. I'm going to I'm gonna have to download it on your phone, Gene. Uh, okay. But Jeffrey, I'll just send you a link. And uh, I'd love to see you guys yeah. there because it's just wonderful to continue the discussion and talk about these things. Uh, next week, we have some really exciting live streams happening. I am actually interviewing Cody Wilson um, on, in relation to what Jeffrey and Gene talked about three weeks ago, we were talking about 3D printed guns. We were also talking about this decentralized world and, and how governments sort of reached a point where the tables have turned and there's there's um, uh, perhaps more power on the side of the individual than we realize and that people are talking about at the moment. So I'll be interviewing him on Tuesday. Uh, so make sure you tune into that. Um, and if anyone has ideas for what they would like to hear Jeffrey and Jean discuss in the next live stream, please let me know. I know last uh, last session we had the idea of we'd like to hear you debate taxation is theft. Um, I think that's a really interesting idea. It's such a such a catchphrase amongst uh, libertarians. Okay. So hearing that debate, it could be an option, but I'll. I'll crowdsource that and see what they come up with and what they want to hear from you. But as always, you guys are so wonderful. Just a huge thank you for, for being here and sharing your intellect. We all grew tremendously and our IQ gets a, a lot higher just listening to you both. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sign off. Bye-bye. Thank yeah. you. Right. Bye -bye. See ya. Yeah.